hey, babe, I have this idea. And she just looks at me and she goes, oh my God, here we go again. And you're dreaming about what you're going to be when you grow up. Never, ever, 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 ever in the history of all humankind. Did any 12-year-old little boy or girl lay in bed at night dreaming of being a homeless, crack addict, prostitute? Never happened. And then there's Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And then the Lord God took the man, settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. And uh, this really and truly is the foundation of everything that we do out here in, in, in the village. Uh, it's one, trying to settle people to help them rediscover uh, their gifts and talents so that they can be cultivate with those gifts and talents. And when they're settled and they're cultivating, leveraging those gifts and talents, they begin to care for something outside themselves. My name is Alan Graham and I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Mobile Loads and Fishes founded in 1998 uh, by myself from an uh, idea that I had uh, in my head. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, five other co-founders uh, with me that joined me ultimately uh, in this vision. And, and the vision really kind of began back in, uh, uh, you know, the 1980s uh, when my wife and I started having children. Um, she started taking the kids back to church. And I had five children. And at the time, there were probably a couple of them on the ground. Both my wife and I are uh, uh, seven day a week workaholic types. Uh, so it was not unusual on a Sunday for me to get, you know, read the paper and then get up and shower and go into the office to do some work to get ready for uh, the week ahead of us. And one day I'm sitting in the easy chair and there she is, uh, uh, door opens up and she and a couple of the young kids are uh, headed out the door to go to go to church. And uh, at that point, it looked to me like the train was leaving the station and I wasn't on that train. So I made a decision at that point in time that I'm going to I'm going to go back to church. And if I am, I'm one of these guys that kind of goes in pretty deep Uh I want to understand why I'm doing this. And uh, so I just started reading about my uh, faith. I'm, I'm Roman Catholic and uh, I grew up that way, but wasn't catechized uh, uh, very well. And um, I started studying the church and, and fell in love with kind of what I call the train wreck of Christianity. Uh, I fell in love with uh, uh, the heresies, the schisms, uh, the reformations, uh, uh, and, and it was just a, a two thousand year drama uh, that continues to unfold. That 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 enamored me, and and for me and my faith, I ended up developing a, a very intellectual relationship with uh, Jesus, and um, and then in nineteen ninety six, I was invited to go on a men's retreat, where I had I known that men were going to hold hands with each other and. Uh, hug it out and pray. I would have never gone uh, on that uh, on that journey. But here I am in the middle of this deal, uh, and they're doing all those things. And initially, I'm extremely uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, over the course of about 30 hours, uh, something profound and revelatory happened. And this intellectual relationship that I had up here literally dropped the floor into the depths of the cave of my heart. Uh, and it was a game changer. And at that point, uh, John Lou, I just began to, uh, God, what do you want me to do? I mean, you know, and I had a successful real estate development career going on at the time. And, um, and so, you know, I started doing things at church. Uh, no big deal. One thing after another, diving in and uh, and doing that. And then in 1998, uh, my wife and I were having coffee with a girlfriend, and she was telling us about this ministry in Corpus Christi, Texas, where on cold winter nights, multiple churches would come together, pool their abundance to take out to the men and women that were on the streets of Corpus Christi who lacked 
uh, that abundance. And at that moment, out of my subconscious mind uh, came the image of this catering truck as a distribution vehicle from those of us that have abundance to those that lack. And as a, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, that, that idea would not leave my brain. I thought I was onto something. And, uh, and in, a, in a week or two, I, I, I started, I shared it with my wife. I said, hey, babe, I had this idea. And she just looks at me and she goes, oh my God, here we go again. Because she's married to an entrepreneur. And, um, and so really, uh, that's what happened. We started going out on the streets, feeding these men and women fell in love with them. And here I am nearly a quarter century later uh, on top of what we believe is a pretty big movement uh, moving throughout the United States called Community First. Uh, when you started the, uh, the truck uh, food services, one thing that you said was really striking and you said um, you want to be on the same side of the truck uh, as the person who you serve the food to. Can, can you talk, tell us why that's important? Well, we didn't know it at the time, but there were really three things about that truck that in retrospect turned out to be extremely powerful. Number one is that the truck went to where the people are. We, we didn't herd them to a soup kitchen. That's, that's not an anti-soup kitchen comment. It's just that uh, we try to centralize and consolidate and economize everything. And it takes the humanity out of uh, humans. Uh, and then the second thing is, is that uh, we never put leftover stuff on the truck. It was always fresh, store-bought food, uh, uh, and it was abundant, and it allowed people to make a choice, which was beautiful. And again, if you go to the soup kitchen, you're going to get whatever the, the food unit is that day. And then the third thing, the important one that you related to is that those of us that were serving and those being served were the, on the same side of the serving counter, which required a one-on-one, -on -one, human to human, heart to heart connection. And that's when I could go up and go, hey, my name is uh, Alan. And somebody would say, hey, my name is uh, Beverly. And next thing you know, it's Alan and Beverly, not the food unit thing. And so food became the conduit to connect you and I heart to heart. And as all of us know, uh, food turns out to be really the number one way that you and I uh, connect human to human, heart to heart. Uh, that table is, turns out to be very important to us. You mention the word dignity a lot. Um, and then that's something that I don't usually hear when I talk with say policymakers or you know, uh, academics who do research in this. So can you tell us a, a little bit about dignity and why that is important? Well, um, inherent in each one of us at the moment that we are created, and, and clearly I believe that we are created by God, but however one believe, uh, there are two uh, innate qualities in us every one of us de desires to be fully and wholly loved. Uh, you desire to be loved by your parents. You desire to be loved by your siblings and your grandparents. You desire to be loved by your partner. Uh, it's just very important. And then the second thing is, is that each of us desires to be fully and wholly known, to be valued for who we are and the gifts that we can bring uh, into the world. And, uh, uh, and it's really from that, that, that the dignity of the hu human person uh, can manifest. And it, and it really begins with being fully and wholly loved and cared for. And if we just treat people transactionally, and that's what policy does, uh, because, you know, I can't make you love me. Uh, I can, I can make you, uh, maybe not treat me deferentially, like if I'm a, a black person or a brown person or you know, a gay person or a, something else, uh, but I can't make you love me. Uh, and so uh, policy can only go so far uh, in the world. 
uh, but policy cannot uh, uh, create and demand uh, dignity for people. Thank you for that. I, I, I just, I totally agree with you. And, and also I feel a lot of times we are talking about, we use the term housing first as if as long as we have a house, we put people in the apartment, then our job is done. And then the success defined there was, hey, they stay housed. As if that's a success, I feel like, well, there are many, many other things we, we haven't achieved yet, such as you know, whether the person is respecting themselves. And then I feel that's something that your community first, uh, the, the under, under this belief is really delivering. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between the housing first versus your community first? Well, if you really wanna understand homelessness, you first have to understand what home is. And I will tell you that there's an attempt right now in the system to change the language from a homeless person to a houseless uh, person. And we reject that change. Uh, this is really about being homeless. And I believe, uh, and in the book Beyond Homelessness, Christian Faith in a Culture of Displacement published in 2008 uh, by a couple of uh, theologians, uh, guys, they talk about the phenomenology of home. And within the phenomenology of home are eight characteristics of home. One, home is the place of permanence. Two, home is a dwelling place. It, it's that place that when I cross over the threshold, it's as if I liquefy and, and, you know, and move into every nook and cranny of the home. Home is a place of embodied inhabitation. Uh, if you come into my office, you can see lots of things around on the wall that embody who I am as an individual. Uh, you come to my home and you can see the embodiment of my family over the past uh, uh, 35, 40 years that my wife and I have been together, uh, including we still have the the thing on the wall that you would measure the kids as they grow up. And you know what they do now? They measure me because I shrink and they, they laugh, you know, at my shrinking. Um, <laughs> and then home is a place of hospitality. You know, when you invite someone into your home, you unfold hospitality. Home is a place of safety and refuge. I, I tell people that the home that I raised my family in for 34 years, nobody had a key to that home, it was never locked. Uh, we lived in a community and in a place where we felt safe and secure. Home is a place of stories and memories. And it's often said that the mortar that holds the bricks of even the most impoverished homes together are the stories and memories that flow from that home. Home is a place of orientation and no matter where I've been in the world, and I've been in some pretty cool places around the world, my compass is always oriented to Austin, Texas and where I live. And then last and not least, and very important, home is a place of affiliation and belonging. And it turns out that you and I like to be around people that are a lot like you and I. So uh, already I can tell that you're of Asian descent. Uh, if I found out what your uh, religious or non-religious beliefs were, if I discovered what your political beliefs were, uh, I know that you're a PhD, um, and so you're in an economic uh, place, I could des describe a, a lot about who your friends are, the close ones, okay? And uh, they're going to be a lot like you are. That doesn't mean that we don't have relationships with people that are outside of who we are. We do, but that core group of people are going to be a lot like uh, uh, you are. And notice that in none of those eight characteristics does it have anything to do with four walls and a roof. And so that should be number one. And it doesn't mean we don't need shelter. We do. But if all we do uh, is take somebody out of an environment of being homeless, of being mentally ill, physically ill, a drug addict, 
uh, despised outcast, and then try to stick them into an apartment complex full of, uh, uh, you know, upper income PhDs that teach at Stanford, it's not going to work out very well. And, and that is the failure of housing first. Now, um, we're not a we're not a disbeliever in housing first. We're just a disbeliever that there's only one way uh, to mitigate this pandemic, and that's where we uh, struggle with that. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I totally agree. I, I feel like housing first should be in combination with the supportive system, such as family and community uh, and other relationships. Um, yeah. So that's why I really like your philosophy. Um, and then also you, last time when we chatted, I, I remember you said something about, um, you know, the, the, the family breaking down, which is at the root cause of uh, homelessness. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as, uh, as we journeyed along uh, in, in my journey, my quarter century journey with my friends from the street, uh, begin to sleep with them and hang out with them and then lift them up off the street. One, one common denominator began to flow out of that. And that was uh, that they all, all, almost without exception, came from traumatically broken, catastrophically broken families. Um, and, and that there wasn't a forged family ar around them in order um, uh, to pick up the pieces, to be that fundamental safety net. And it really begins in the womb. And if you, if you were born into a family that was smoking crack while you were being nourished and then you were born and you, you weren't wanted, um, it, it becomes uh, uh, pretty incredible. And then, um, uh, you know, we took on that belief, but as our quarter century journey began, uh, you know, to unfold on us, there was also a lot of research being done uh, in academic institutions around uh, trauma, trauma-informed care, adverse childhood experiences uh, that, you know, were, were moving the needle into understanding how important the early years of our life are. And then last year, a beautiful book was written by Oprah Winfrey and, uh, and Bruce Perry, called What Happened to You, uh, and Bruce Perry is a PhD, MD, uh, neuroscientist guy, uh, a brilliant guy, and uh, obviously everybody knows Oprah, uh, but she also came from a, a catastrophically broken uh, family background, uh, was molested as a kid, was beat, you know, uh, as a kid, was unwanted by her uh, biological mom, and and dad and uh, uh, struggled through all that. And uh, reading this book, you realize that, you know, uh, humans, as we've evolved on the evolutionary timeline, uh, the anthropological timeline, uh, we were always raised in these 100 to 150 unit tribes or clans or uh, what have you. And typically, uh, there were four adults uh, for every one child within these clans. And today we celebrate when, when we can afford daycare for our children, uh, where there is one adult for four children. And so from four to one to one to four is a sixteenth of the care uh, and, and so this is what we're doing societally here in America, and I believe it's, it's, uh, it's propagating throughout the world. The more westernized the world uh, becomes, uh, the more, uh, uh, you know, we witness, uh, you know, that deal. And, and this is not good for the human family. And so, um, uh, you know, our whole goal really is to try to help build up a forged family uh, that cares about each and every member of the family, no matter what they're doing and how they're behaving. As you just mentioned, in the past, it was four to one. 
um, grown up to child ratio and then now is one to four. I mean, my kid, and they're five and seven. And so they were in daycare not long ago. And if you can get into a daycare with one to four ratio, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, no, you're, <laughs> you should you're, be very happy about yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, and then I do think you know there's there there might be some kind of relationship between that kind of a longing for attention, right? Children just want you, your attention, and when they don't get it, I don't yeah. know what kind of long term effect that's going to have on them when they grow up. Yeah, well, um, you know, in a lot of ways, you're able to mask uh, this tragic, this human tragedy that's unfolding because you are part of a class that can afford, say, a one to four or, you know, something in that range because of where you are economically. I'm sure you and your husband do uh, relatively well. So people like us can go and afford that. But if you live in poverty, you're you're not buying that one to four or, you know, one to five or one to seven or whatever it is. You're, you're stuffing them in a, you know, one to 12, one to 15 type of a type of a deal, if you can even afford that. And sometimes you're leaving them alone where it's zero because the mother, a single mom's got to go off and work and just leave the kid at home alone. So Right, right. with a TV or with some kind of uh, electronic babysitter, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. I, I also see you um, say something about we need to uh, break down the stereotypes of other human beings um, who may not be perfect, uh, who may cause trouble sometimes. And so how, how can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's very important in your community? Well, we have five corporate goals at Mobile Oats and Fishes. And goal number one is to transform the paradigm, paradigm as to how people view the stereotypes of the homeless. And when that, uh, when that goal was set out there, it was really to uh, transform, because people believe that the homeless are lazy, that they've chosen that lifestyle, that they choose to do dope uh, and alcohol. And uh, if they would just go get mental health help, they could get out of that problem, or they could just go get a job, they wouldn't have uh, that problem. And, that was kind of my motivation at the time. Uh, now, it turns out that in the homeless population, uh, you got a lot more than just that, those stereotypes to transform. You got uh, African Americans that are in there, you've got white people in there, you got Christian, Jews, Zoroastrian, Buddhists, Hindus, you know, in that community, you got Asians in the community, uh, you've got. Uh, uh, gender identity people and uh, transgendered and um, uh, y y you name it, you got it in there, uh, but th they're all humans. And what I've discovered, it, and this is how I like to describe it, that um, when, when you go back to when you were 12 years old, all of us, every human, and you're laying in bed at night and you're in that twilight zone from being awake uh, to be in a sleep and you're looking out the window at the starry starry nights and you're dreaming about what you're going to be when you grow up never ever 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 in the history of all humankind did any 12 year old little boy or girl lay in bed at night dreaming of being a homeless crack addict prostitute never happened we were all dreaming about being rock stars, football players, uh, uh, jet fighter pilots. That was my deal, those three things. Uh, I don't know what you were dreaming about uh, when you a were little. Oh, were you, huh? <laughs> I wanted to be a zookeeper when I was young. Well, in, <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, and my bet is, is that you had a mom and dad and a family unit that was pouring fuel on those embers of dreams that you had. Uh, and then at some point in time, you decided, you know, you know, that call it a different track, whatever track you ended on, up on that allowed you to ultimately become, uh, you know, a, a PhD in the work that you're 
uh, that you're doing right now. But we were surrounded by people that were pouring fuel on those those little embers. And and I'll guarantee you, there's still a zookeeper thing in you. Even to this day, whatever it was that inspired you then, uh, inspires you today. And I'm not a rock star. I'm not an NFL football player. And I'll never fly uh, an F-22 Raptor. Uh, but when a great rock song song comes on i'm on that stage with that guitar in hand or when a great football you know or when a jet goes screaming across the sky i see myself still at nearly 66 years old uh flying that jet i know i never will but those embers are still alive and, and for me what we want to do is capture those dreams and these men and women that are out there pour fuel on them to see where those dreams can lead to uh, today. And what I find are uh, uh, potential Van Goghs, uh, a beautiful artist. I've got art uh, all over my walls that are painted by men and women that live in this community. Beautiful, very fine art. Uh, Van Gogh, by the way, happened to be uh, mentally ill, uh, probably an addict. Uh, and uh, one of the greatest artists of all time uh, history, committed suicide, had a brother that loved him yeah. and cared for him. And so, um, you know, what we try to do is help people rediscover a purpose in their lives so that they can be fully and wholly known uh, the way that you, you and I are. I, I really love you mentioned uh, purpose and goal, and we all need that, right? Even Even normal people like me, I... You know, once in a while, I'll be like kind of depressed. I'm like, what's the meaning? Why am I doing this? Right? I feel like we always need to have, you know, the have, have our head straight and really understand what 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 is what the, our purposes are. And I I really am interested in hearing your thoughts on because you said you know in your community you kind of help people rediscover their dreams, their purpose, their meaning of life. Um, how do you do that, right? Like, for example, like someone who may have experienced trauma and became homeless and sort of giving up on their life, how do you manage to bring them back? Well, um, it's not an easy task, and there's a lot of distrust uh, from men and women that have been on the streets for uh, quite a long time, and uh, it, it takes a varying degree of time, depending on the individual. Uh, some might acclimate pretty quickly uh, into our community uh, environment uh, because it's a community of uh, accountability. Uh, uh, you can't do anything in here. Everybody's watching. Uh, we're, you know, we're a pretty tight knit uh, uh, little community. And, uh, but, and for some people, it might take years. I mean, if you've been smoking crack for 40 years, uh, you, you're just not going to stop. Uh, and so we just try to get people to, to mitigate uh, these things that were exacerbating the problems in their lives a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. So that maybe a few years down the road, uh, they no longer have to... Uh, uh, squelch their trauma, past trauma and pain by doing things like crack or meth or heroin or something like that, alcohol. Um, so you said, this is from Genesis, you quote it in your uh, video, uh, the Lord God took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and take care of it. And can you tell us the meaning of that to your community? Yeah, and uh, there's a little bit longer uh, meaning to that. I'm going to give you the little bit longer. If you back up a little bit in Genesis chapter two, and uh, you know God had just created the everything, and it was it was very good what He created. But then the land was barren. There were there were there were, there was no grass. There were no trees. There were no field shrubs. There was no water to nourish the land, but suddenly up out of the ground, a, a bubbling brook uh, uh, started to come out. 
and the grass began to grow and the trees uh, were happening and uh, and you know God needed somebody to tend it so he he reached out of the heavens and dug into the ground and grabbed a clump of clay and began to go in and mold who you are and you know I love the contrast between you on this Zoom call and me. I'm a Northern European bald guy, and you're this beautiful Asian with, you've got, you know, the Asian characteristics. And it, it's clear that we're similar as humans, but they're the nuances and the beauty of the differences of who we are. And, and, and if you can metaphorically envision God molding you, touching you, uh, and then creating this inanimate object that looks like you, but then he needs to come in and in, in Genesis chapter two and breathe life into your nostrils. Now, if I'm to come in and breathe life into your nostrils, I, I just can't blow from here. I got to go all the way in. And so what God was doing in the molding and the breathing of the life was mirroring for us what we need to do for others. And so uh, your partner, your husband, your two children, there's a deep level of intimacy in that, in those relationships. And you're molding and breathing life into them every single day. And, um, and then uh, God has this Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden now is, uh, 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 you know, all the fruit and nut bearing trees, the animals that are good to look at, that provide you and I companionship, that are some of them are tasty to eat. And in the middle of the Garden of Eden is the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and into the garden from the east flows a river, and the moment that the river penetrates the garden, and it divides into four branches, four nourishing veins, four capillaries that are bringing uh, water to the entire uh, garden, and along one of those called the Pishon, uh, there is gold, and the gold of that land is excellent. And also there is bdellium and lapis lazuli. And I laugh at this because, you know, God put a jewelry store in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Uh, and why? And because of this lavish abundance for you and I. And then there's Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And then the Lord God took the man, settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. And uh, this really and truly is the foundation of everything that we do out here in, in, in the village. Uh, it's one, trying to settle people, two, help them rediscover uh, their gifts and talents so that they can be, cultivate with those gifts and talents. And when they're settled and they're cultivating, leveraging those gifts and talents, they begin to care for something outside themselves. So. Um, if you take the birth of your children, how dependent were they on you? Uh, well, uh, completely dependent in everything. Uh, uh, they, need, they needed to suckle at your breast. They needed somebody to change their diapers. They uh, needed somebody to uh, cuddle and, and nurture. And, and the older they become, the more independent of those things they can become until at some point in time, they're doing all of those things for someone else. And that's the care uh, part of that, of that deal. And that's what we're trying to mirror. So God wants us to mirror the intimacy of molding, uh, the intimacy of breathing life. And, um, and that means sometimes breathing life into people that may not be doing uh, what we want them to do. Like, uh, I, I hope that you raising your children are seamless, I doubt it will be. Uh, uh, I had five uh, children. Uh, it was a great run. Uh, 
but you know there was some pot smoking and that alcohol you know things going on when they got a little older that uh that that wasn't uh wasn't what i wanted them to, to do at that age so uh yeah. I, I love i love your analogy i mean you using the term of breathing the air into to someone who may not be completely perfect but the the, the point is care for someone who is not ourselves yeah. and and then i feel that's something i really deeply believe that's something missing in our society today um everything is in such a like a hustle we're always hustling for something and i don't even know what we're hustling for as, yeah. as you said it's transactional a lot of things are transactional we don't go to church anymore we don't have community i mean we have some but not as as tight knit communities as in the past. So I was going to ask you about, um, do, do you know any reasons why uh, today, not just in the US, but around the world, you know, communities are not as tight knit as in say 50s or 60s? Well, um, there were, there are cultures in the world still that have uh, pretty profound family, uh, values. I would say that, uh, uh, you know, particularly uh, Latins and Asians, uh, you know, but you can see the, you know, you, like in China, you can see the diminution of those values uh, over time, but in other Asian countries, no, you see a very profound, uh, uh, you know, set of family values. I would say for America, uh, which I can speak on behalf of, I, I, I could just look into other cultures and, and admire or not admire those things. But in America, uh, we have this extraordinary constitution of the United States of America uh, that I think is one of the greatest documents ever written. But in there uh, are the rights, the inherent rights of the individual. And, and I have witnessed uh, both historically and then over my lifetime, a, uh, an increase in, in, in the recognition of the individual's rights that is causing a collateral, negative collateral impact on the rights of the community. And, um, and I think over time, uh, in a very insidious way, uh, that's been building uh, to the point uh, where now many of these individual, these constitutional individual uh, court agreed to rights are now having a negative impact on our, our community life. And it, so it's complex. And then, um, you know, I... Uh, you know, when you think about our our anthropological evolution, uh, that for the overwhelming vast majority of all of mankind, we were always located in coastal areas because that's where the food is. Because uh, we could go out, we could fish, and. If 200 years ago, I went out and had a great catch of fish, my only choice was to share that abundance with the community. And then not that long ago, about 100 years-ish ago, was the advent of refrigeration. And now I could catch all that fish and hoard it for a long period of time. I didn't have to share it with you any longer. Uh, and then air conditioning came along. And then the automobile uh, came along. Um, and then we built these, what I call hermetically sealed single family sarcophaguses that we call the American dream, the home, uh, that have everything in them, air conditioning, refrigeration, uh, the internet spewing in, uh, the backyards with eight foot tall privacy fences with swimming pools, sport courts, and barbecue pits. And our front porches uh, went from being these giant things uh, 
to nothing bigger than an iPhone six plus, uh, you know, uh, you know, no front porch, just these backyards. And uh, we just keep moving away uh, from each other and isolating within our own little self. And now we get to pick up this thing and I get to yell at you on this, you know, and, and how terrible you are, this person. And I, I don't know, this is not good for our community. And I hope we figure this all out because it's gonna hurt us. I totally agree. I, I feel, um, I mean, all the things that you have mentioned are um, factors that kind of feeds into the breaking down of, um, I call it social fabric. Um, and, and also on top of that, you know, we do have the new technology, iPhone and social media, which are all blessings that I'm really grateful for their invention. But at the same time, I do feel we are, um, we're, we're sort of too engrossed in them. And then oftentimes we're just looking at our iPhone instead of chatting with our friends or family members. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, yeah, uh, that's, that's ex extraordinary that we, our society is in such a way that's all, we're all in our own little world without talking to each other. Yeah, now in a lot of ways we're being manipulated in our thoughts. So, uh, uh, you know, the social media channels and Facebook and these things are feeding the stuff that they want to feed us. So if they see me... Uh, searching for a particular philosophical thing. Next thing you know, they're just dumping that stuff uh, my way. I, I don't know, man. It's, uh, right. yeah. I also want to ask you um, about your thoughts. Um, uh, so yesterday, well, I think it's two days ago, uh, New York City uh, opened up their first supervised drug injection site. Um, and so to me, I, I don't know, I, f I have very uh, mixed feelings about it. Um, even though doctors say, well, it's going to be better for the patients, but at the same time, at some level, I just feel maybe that's going to uh, promote uh, you know, the drug use or uh, something like that. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Well, um, there was a book uh, published in uh, 2015, uh, called Chasing the Scream, S-C-R-E-A-M, Scream, like yelling, Chasing the Scream, uh, the beginning and the end of the 100-year war on drugs. Uh, I didn't find the book to be the greatest book ever, but chapters 12 and 13 are absolutely compelling. And in, in that deal, they... Um, followed the research of a brilliant uh, young psychologist back in the 1970s named Bruce Armstrong, I believe. I think that's the name, um, from the University of Toronto. And the drug wars were always built around these uh, experiments with these rats uh, where they would put a rat you know, in a cage, and they would give the rat the opportunity to drink fresh water or drink uh, water laced with uh, opiate or uh, cocaine or something like that. And over the uh, course of about 60 days, uh, the rat would increase its consumption of the drugged water to about 25 milligrams a day. And and uh, almost always die within the 60 days. And this guy said, time out on this. We're going to try something different. And they created a rat park where there were lots of rats. There were rat trails. There were rat wheels. There were rat balls to play with. There were rat friends. There were rats to have sex with. There were rat babies. Uh, and they had the water and the drug water, and the maximum consumption of the drug water, which for the individual rat was 25 milligrams a day, and the community of rats dropped to five milligrams a day, and nobody ever died in the, the deal. 
And um, to me, it was it was compelling to uh, to understand that if we if we bring people into community and we care for them and and within our village here, uh, our little experiments and we're, we are not a uh, you know there's not been a blind study you know uh, longitudinal uh, anything done in our deal, but we've done some statistically valid uh, research that suggests that there's an 80% drop in drug use from the streets to the village and a and a 60% drop in alcohol use. Now, uh, I, I can tell you that if you're used to drinking a half a gallon of vodka a day and, and you go to a quarter of a gallon, you still got a problem. Uh, but um, I believe that when we when we look at what humans really need uh, and then begin to look at what can we do with policy that will, will aid what the humans actually need? And so uh, I think there's value to a legalization philosophy, but it's got to be within the boundaries of community. And, uh, and so without the boundaries of community, um, I'm not sure what kind of results that we're going to see. Now, I'll tell you that in Switzerland and Portugal, uh, 10, 15 years ago, and that, that's in this book uh, as well, uh, they legalized drugs and made it available and uh, 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 drug arrests, drug incarcerations, drug overdoses leading to death uh, dropped to virtually zero. So I, I don't know, man. Uh, it's complex. I, I can tell you more than anything, we need people to love and care for us and, uh, and, and fully and wholly know us. I, I really love that. I, I feel what you said and just now about uh, we need a community and we need to bring, we need to bring the dreams back to the people, right? We need to sort of help them discover, rediscover uh, their purpose. And then so that that's something that only a community and your family and your friends can bring to you. And I feel um, it's not, you know, we're not, we're not going to achieve that just by doing something like scientific experiment or setting up a, a site. I mean, that's just my opinion, but um, yeah. you know, we'll see. I agree, so yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I wanna switch gear to ask you a little bit about your um, amazing community. Um, so, I mean, if you don't mind of uh, sharing some numbers with us, like, because we know, maybe you can just tell us how many people are currently housed in your community and, you know, what kind of situation they're in, like, how much money did you spend to build the community and how much you need to keep it running? I mean, the reason I ask that is we know how much money we're spending in California. Everybody thinks it's a crazy amount. And I just want to know, like, how other people are doing. Yeah, well, um, I'll tell you that uh, right now I'm looking at the numbers. We have 312 people uh, living in the community. Uh, that number grows uh, about 10 a month. Uh, it grows. Um, to build our community, uh, and we're on phase one and two, and when we're done with phase one and two, building all the housing, which will be about 540 homes, building all the buildings to support the farming, the movie theater, all the things that we have here, the average cost per home will be under uh, $80,000 per unit for everything. And that, and that will be housing about 540 people. Uh, and so that, that's, that's on the capital cost. On the operating cost, 100% of the men and women that will move into this community will have to be subsidized for life. 
the average income coming in is probably $800 a month. Same average income that you have in California. It's an SSI, SSDI uh, income. That's a federal federal deal. And, uh, uh, and so that subsidy for us uh, costs currently about $19,000 a year per person or $54 per day per person for them to live uh, in this community. And so currently uh, in our operating budget, uh, about, uh, well, 25% of all of our revenue comes from people paying rents and a, and a little other uh, income, uh, other income kind of a thing. About 15% comes from rents, 10% comes from kind of some other income sources that we have. Uh, and then 75% must be raised philanthropically. Okay. And um, we believe as we scale, because we're building, we're, we're going to add another 1,400 homes uh, to this, uh, that that subsidy will drop to maybe close to $10,000 a year per person and about $22, $24 per day uh, per person. So, so why will the subsidies drop? Well, uh, when you scale, uh, you, you know, there's, an, there's scaling. And then uh, if you do it right, there's an economy to scaling. And so I'm the CEO, I'm the highest paid uh, employee and uh, uh, here, uh, but you only need one CEO. Uh, yeah, and so there will be some economies that we will achieve over time uh, as we scale. And that's, that's what we believe will happen in our, in our modeling. I, I guess I was probably confused just now when you said, because I was thinking um, each person, they, they receive like an eight hundred dollar SSI, right? About, right? about that, right. and so they could. So would that? Would they keep it? Would would they give that to you? Right. Well, they pay rent uh, with pay that. Rent, right. So uh, there's going to be a rent uh, structure. We're way under uh, any kind of remote market rent. I mean, you right. can you can rent something as low as two hundred twenty five dollars a month. All bills paid here. Right. Right. Um, and so, uh, but then they get to keep the rest of their money, so. Right, okay. Yeah, so when you, I, I guess I wasn't sure about what the subsidies, so the, is the subsidy something you give them or they give you? Well, you just can't, uh, with them paying 200 or 300 or $500 a month, depending on what their rent structure, you can't operate a village like this on those type of rents. That's, that's where the subsidy, market rate for these rents should probably be three times uh, or more what we currently rent to people. Oh, so when you say subsidy, it's more some, the money comes from um, the community pot um, that's going to be paid into, you know, the running of the community, keep everything uh, running and perfect. But then you yeah. need to raise money, right? You need to, ra you need to keep that pot. That's um, correct. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, so that pot to, to, to run this, 25% uh, of it could come from rent and other income, and 75% of it will come philanthropically. Got it. And, and then you said, um, it's, I, I think I was taking notes. So currently it would be um, $54 per day, right? So basically yeah. uh, we need to provide the individual about $54 per day to keep everything running. Yeah, well, uh, it, it wouldn't go to the individual that would go to us. Right, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just right. like, you know, if you calculate it that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so if you take $800 uh, of their month, you know, they got their monthly income of 800 and then you say, let's just use the round number of $50 a day times, uh, you know, 30 days in the year, that would be another 1500 dollars so in essence that's twenty two hundred dollars a month which is still under the individual poverty level uh in austin texas you know for sure and without a question because of the cost of living in california uh 
you know, the individual poverty level, I bet it's 35, 40,000 bucks a year. I see. Yes. I mean, I, I feel you guys are doing it at a much, much la- lower cost than yeah. what California is spending. Um, so I'm al- also curious about, uh, so you said, you know, 75% is, is from donation. Do you receive any government funding or mostly just the donation? No, it's mostly just the donations, uh, especially on operating. Uh, but recently on our capital side through the uh, American Rescue Funds, uh, we're getting a, a very significant uh, amount of money to build our the, the next uh, couple of phases of the operation. I see. That's great. So uh, could you like share with us some pointers on why? Uh, because you mentioned, you know, the capital cost is about $80,000 to build one home, right? Uh, and then that's wonderful. And then could you maybe like share some ideas why uh, when when the government is doing it, it's it's causing triple or quadruple the cost? Well, uh, the government layers an extraordinary amount of requirements on top of people that are going to be building housing that's going to be subsidized both in capital and in operations uh, by the government. And uh, and that layer, the government is extraordinarily risk averse. And because we, the taxpayers, don't want the government to take risk, which is a ridiculous deal. And so um, uh, no risk, no innovation. And um, uh, that's why you see, you know, people like Elon Musk building rocket ship companies. And it's hard for the government to do what Elon or Jeff Bezos or, you know, um, Bill Allen or any of these other guys are doing in these highly risky deals that, you know, sometimes rocket ships are going to blow up and kill people. And, um, and so in the homeless space, uh, they've oriented almost entirely to this housing first movement uh, as being the sole way uh, that we can mitigate and to build and be subsidized to build a housing first unit. In Texas, it's going to be two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars per unit. In California, that's uh, six to eight hundred thousand dollars a unit, and um, uh, because we think everybody's got to have a bathroom inside their house, we think everybody's got to have this thing. They got to have this much space, and um, you know, layer after layer after layer, and. Uh, next thing you know, uh, our policies have men and women living under the bridges on our street corners. And, uh, uh, and in effect, that's what the government policies have created. I totally agree. I, I, I also watched your video showing um, the Community First Movement adopted 3D printed houses. Yeah. That's just amazing. Yeah. How can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's going to save you and then the community a lot of money? Well, um, you know, honestly, right now, 3D printing is not the answer to uh, affordable housing. Uh, they've got a long way to go. It's a beautiful technology. These are brilliant uh, uh, technologists. Uh, and they're coming together with some of the largest home builders in the world uh, right now. We're working on another pretty big project with them uh, to do uh, more units. They're going to do it at their expense, so it's not going to cost us anything. Uh, uh, so for that, we like it a lot. That makes it very affordable. Um, but there are affordable ways to build housing. And one of those ways is manufactured housing. And uh, 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 we think the most uh, inexpensive way to build ha- housing is to manufacture those inside of a manufacturing facility and deliver those units, uh, you know, on site out here. And, uh, but uh, cities don't, you know, want mobile homes. And, uh, and, uh, 
And so we get forced into building these, like in California, six to $800,000 per unit deals when we could easily get somebody off the streets for under $100,000. It's crazy. That's, that's, yeah, that's just staggering. Um, I also want to, I know that I'm almost out of time. I'm already out of time, but I want to ask you uh, about how the, um, um, all the men and women in your community they're not just free riders. They're actually putting their talents into work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the number one rule here is you must pay rent. And um, it turns out that we have uh, very little, very negligible rent collection problems with people. And that always surprises people. But when people pay rent, when they're invested in what it is uh, that they're paying into, they take care of it in a different way. We all do. Uh, uh, you know, when you buy your house, you're taking care of it in a different way than when you rent your house. And, uh, and so, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, a lot of that dignity is building a culture of people caring about their community. They see me walking around. I live in the middle of this community. It's a beautiful place. And uh, they see me bending over and picking up cigarette butts. So guess what happens? The, the cigarette smokers stop throwing their butts on the ground. Or you get other people that are bending over, picking up the cigarette butts. Or if I see another, somebody miss their dog pooping in the yard, I, I, I reach in my pocket and I, I've got my bags, you know, that I carry around that, uh, uh, because it's my community. And then, you know, so we, we build this culture of community uh, and, you know, and challenging people to, to own the community. And it, it, it works, not 100%, but a, a lot. I think this goes back to what you said about um, caring, right? So the homeless individuals, well, used to be homeless individuals, they, once they started to care about their environment, about their neighbors, and that can help them rediscover their purpose and meaning. And then I, I think that's going to motivate them to, to live a better life. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree 100%, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I, I know I have so many things that I can just talk with you all day, but you know, I, I know your time is precious and you have so many important projects on your hand and I don't wanna stop you from doing that. I, I just wanna say thank you so much for speaking with me two weeks ago and speaking with me again today. And I just really, really appreciate all you have done.